Brisbane's just hosted the fifth Congress on Conservation Agriculture, an event that brought together around 500 of the world's leading agricultural and soil scientists. Among them, researchers who pioneered the techniques and equipment that have dramatically reduced and in some cases completely eliminated conventional cultivation. And it wasn't all PowerPoint presentations and speeches either. Landline dropped in on the Congress Field Day at the University of Queensland campus at Gatton in the Lockyer Valley. If the whole idea is to minimise the impact of food and fibre production on farmland, then this approach is about as light as a feather. This model helicopter is part of the burgeoning squadron of unmanned surveillance systems helping leading edge growers tweak their paddocks. The data they collect can significantly reduce the amount of water, fertiliser, herbicides and pesticides that need to be applied to get the crop over the line. And they were one of the star attractions at the field day organised in conjunction with the World Congress on Conservation Agriculture. John Kierkegaard's a plant scientist with the CSIRO very high adoption in Australia. We, we probably started playing with it in the 70s, but since the 90s we've, we've moved right up to now um, 80 to 90 per cent of farmers would be, would be using forms of conservation agriculture on up to 80 to 90 per cent of their cropped land. So controlled traffic, no-till, those kinds of strategies? That's right. Retaining the three principles are really uh, less disturbance of the soil, maintaining cover on the surface and having a diverse rotation. Control traffic is building on that by giving us more precision and more efficiency with our inputs and, and keeping wheel compaction off the, off the cropped paddocks. And where would you put this revolution in terms of the great uh, agricultural revolutions of the past? Well, I think we're seeing the start of perhaps the third revolution. The, the, the first revolu agricultural revolutions were around um, new inputs like fertiliser and the green revolution, new varieties. What we need now is a, is a revolution in efficiency of input use because we've, we've got less land, we're going to be constrained with water, we need to double food production. So what we really need is a, is a revolution of efficiency and conservation agriculture is all about getting efficiencies of water use, labour, land and, and importantly inputs like fertilisers and, and things like that. Now apart from being early adopters, Australia has, has, has tended to drive a lot of the innovation in this area as well, hasn't it? Absolutely. Um, Australians should be very proud, I think, of their farmers, their innovative farmers and scientists because um, you know, we are at the leading edge of this technology for, for large-scale mechanised agriculture, uh, the sort of agriculture that's in you know, North and South America. Uh, we're farming a very difficult country, dry, variable climate, uh, generally infertile soils. So to make these sorts of systems work under those conditions has is, is, um, been a real um, challenge, but, but the farmers have been up to it. And a lot of the people that are here attending this conference are in countries where Australia is actually extending that knowledge and, 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 and giving and lending its expertise. That's right. Australia punches well above its weight in, in the international arena in this area. We, we have a lot of uh, scientists who've, who've headed up international um, centres for, for, for this kind of agriculture. Um, and we are still have active programs in you know, Africa, India, places like that. Uh, different systems, but the same principles can be applied uh, and in countries with similar difficult climates such as, as, as Australia has. For these serious scientific tyre kickers, the trade displays cover the whole range of equipment, from tractors, seeders and sprayers with pinpoint accuracy worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, down to more basic models aimed at subsistence farmers, who according to the Food and Agricultural Organisation need to be the next big adopters of conservation agriculture. We have now entered at a global level into an exponential growth phase. We are now at about 8% of the cropland. Um, just to give you a, a, a comparison, we have outpaced organic farming uh, uh, in, a, in a much shorter time. Actually, when we, when we started, when conservation agriculture as a brand, as a concept started, we were half of the area of, of organic farming. And uh, in the meantime, we, we are, I think, uh, multiple of organic farming area in, in, in the world. We have now reached more than 120 million hectares and I think organic farming is still around the 30 million. So what have been the big drivers? Big drivers originally were pressures on farmers, basically erosion. Well, the original 
history is from the Dust Bowl in the United States, but also Brazil, for example, southern Brazil had tremendous erosion problems. Then drought here in, in Australia, drought problems in Central Asia, drought problems. Um, but um, also profit. Uh, farming is uh, not really profitable in many parts of the world and, and economic pressures have, have also forced farmers. So originally conservation agriculture was very much a farmers driven movement. Is it necessarily a function of just how much money is thrown at it or is it an education thing or a, or a combination of all those things? It's mainly educational. It's, it's in the heads. Uh, it's knowledge. It's uh, a change of mindset. Um, the plough in agriculture has been a, a, a tradition. It's a culture. Um, and this is difficult to, to, to take out of the heads of the people. So simply many people don't know about it. They don't even imagine that you can do farming without plowing. Um, and uh, the basic input into spreading conservation agriculture is actually knowledge. Then comes technology, equipment, all that, that is needed to actually do it. But the start is really the knowledge. And at this Congress, we've seen examples of, I imagine, technology initially developed uh, for major food producing countries like Australia and North America, but which have now been modified to suit, as you say, much, much smaller, more modest agricultural settings. Right. Well, actually, we have now the technologies available for all levels of farmers, from the hand farmer uh, doing the job with a, with a hand hoe up to the, the big farmer for animal traction uh, farmers. There are no-till technologies, conservation agriculture technologies available for at all levels. Unfortunately, not in all countries yet. We have in Brazil a strong industry doing this small equipment. In Paraguay, we have a strong industry. And we are now trying to, to promote this also in, in Africa. And we see now African manufacturers popping up. We see Indian manufacturers doing uh, no-till equipment and increasingly conservation agriculture fit equipment. Chinese manufacturers are, are really struggling to get uh, conservation agriculture equipment on the market. So um, we see this happening, but that is still a, a big bottleneck, the availability of affordable equipment for conservation agriculture for smaller farmers in most countries. Thanks for talking to us on Landline. Thank you.